Bom, meus caros, uh, boa tarde a todos, novamente. Então, uh, prosseguiremos para a nossa segunda sessão, à tarde, agora com as conferências da professora Muriel Loyenberga e depois sucedido pela fala do professor Marco Azevedo. Vou fazer uma brevíssima introdução, é, uma apresentação dos dois. A professora Muriel é postdoctoral research fellow no, no Centro de Ética da Faculdade de Filosofia da Universidade de Zurich. Ela que é especialista em ética de tecnologia, é, inteligência artificial, neuroética, ética médica e uma série de temas correlatos. E nós teremos o prazer de tê-la é, nessa mesa, cujo tema é medicina de precisão. Uh, Professor Muriel, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, I think that it's all set, and I'll give you the floor. Thank you so very much once again, and I give you the floor. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me, for inviting me. Um, yeah, so the topic I want to talk about today is um, technology and the pursuit of self-knowledge. So the idea of this paper is um, that we have all these technologies that can provide us a lot of information about ourselves, um, like health trackers or um, genetic testing or um, algorithmic profiles. And we also seem to have some reasons to pursue self-knowledge. We have reasons to know ourselves. Um, and now this raises the question, should we use those technologies to know ourselves? And what kind of self-knowledge do they offer to us and, and what kind of ethical issues arise there? It's kind of the idea of this paper. Um, and here is briefly what I want to talk about. Um, so first I will look at um, self-knowledge through technology. So what, what information do these te technologies that are now out there um, provide us with? And there I would look at bioinformation technologies and algorithmic profiling. Um, And then I would look at self-knowledge. And first, I want to talk about what the value of self-knowledge is, why would we want to know ourselves, um, to then distinguish between three different types of self-knowledge, which is um, impersonal, critical, and relational self-knowledge. Um, to then, in the third step, look at how these technologies can contribute to these diff three different types of self-knowledge and then raise some ethical concerns in this context. And then I'll just very briefly conclude. Um, okay, so the first category of, of technology I want to talk about is bioinformation technology. So these are technologies that provide us information about our bodies. Um, for example, health and activity trackers from like smartwatches or apps on a smartphone. Um, then we have direct-to-consumer genetic testing. Does that, these are these gene tests that you can, where you can like send in a swap sample, and they will do um, test your genome, and they can tell you who your relatives are, where your ancestors are from, um, genetic disorders, and many other um, parameters they they read from your genome. Um, and a third example would be direct-to-consumer neurotechnology. This is a newer type of technology. There's a picture on the bottom right. Um, these are these neurotechnological devices that you can also just order for use at home. Um, they typically use EEGs um, and some other parameters to say something about your emotional states and stress levels, for example, and some other parameters. Um, But to sum up, like through these types of bioinformation technologies, we can measure a vast range of things about our bodies. We can measure our heart rates, our sleep cycles, temperature, blood oxygen level, as I said, emotional states and stress levels, ancestry, genetic relatives, genetic disorders. Um, so there's barely anything about our bodies that we cannot measure through technology. And a second type of technology I want to look at is algorithmic profiling. So these are these um, digital profiles that are created based on our online behavior or data from um, different databases. And this is typically used for recommender systems. 
So if Netflix recommends you a movie or Spotify recommends you a song um, or YouTube, um, and then also for targeted advertisement, so the ads you see on Google are based on a profile Google generates of, of their users. Um, and it's also used for decision making about individuals. For example, in the job market, where, which job ads you see or whether you go to the next round is often decided based on algorithmic profiling. Um, in the healthcare, resource allocation can be decided um, through algorithmic profiles. And in the justice system, it is sometimes used to assess recidivism risk. How likely are, is someone to reoffend? And the more likely the algorithm considers this person to reoffend, the higher the sentencing might be. Um, these programs have been used in the US, for example. Um, so through these algorithmic profiles, again, we can in, um, infer a vast range of um, characteristics of a person. So for example, spoken languages, age, political opinions, preferences in, in food, in vacation, in anything. Um, whether one is likely to have insomnia or depression can be inferred from social media posts. Um, and as I said, also things like suitability for a job or recidivism risk are determined based on algorithmic profiling. And I want to look at these two types of technologies, by information technology and algorithmic profiling, because they are both um, technologies that have been designed in order to characterize and label us and, and measure us. Um, there are other technologies through which we might learn something about ourselves. Um, I might learn something by looking at my WhatsApp text messages. Um, but these technologies have the purpose of characterizing us. This is why I want to look at them. And bioinformation technologies are designed with the intent to provide information about our, ourselves to us, to, to the user. Um, and of course, algorithmic profiling is designed to provide information about us to others, to companies or to um, government institutions, for example. Um, but this information still feeds back to us and can result in self-knowledge because we, we get those recommendations and those advertisements and we hear about the decisions that are being made about us based on those profiles. So they are often not completely obscure to us, they, they kind of feed back to us and they might contribute to self-knowledge in this way. Okay, so this is the, the technologies that I, I have in mind I want to look at. And now I want to look a bit more at self-knowledge. Um, so first of all, we can think of different reasons why we would want to know ourselves. And these are just um, very briefly some, some reasons why, why self-knowledge is useful. So first of all, it is useful for ourselves, pretty straightforward. It can contribute to our well-being. If you know your body better, you're less likely to get sick. Um, if you know your, what you want to do in your life, you make better decisions. Um, but then it's also useful for others. Some have argued that self-knowledge is necessary to develop virtues and to act morally right, because, because then you, if you know your, your intentions better and, and know why you act, so you're, you're more likely to, to act morally right, you're more transparent to yourself. And we might also just be better collaborators because we, don't, we wouldn't um, start a project where you would know that in, in two months you, you want to um, get out of it again. Um, so you might be more reliable to collaborate with others as well, if you know yourself better. And then some have argued that it is important for what um, Kassam called high road reasons. So for concepts like autonomy or responsibility or authenticity. Um, so for example, for autonomy, like you have to know um, your intentions and desires and your beliefs to really choose and act autonomously and to take responsibility for your actions as well. Um, and then some have also said we may have a duty to ourselves to know ourselves. Um, this is a bit more esoteric and I will not go into details of those arguments, but there are, I think, a lot of very clear reasons why um, self-knowledge would be valuable. Um, and now I think there are different types of self-knowledge that are helpful to distinguish. And for the first distinction between impersonal and critical self-knowledge, I rely on a paper by um, Neil Levy. 
And he says that impersonal self-knowledge um, concerns facts about yourself, which are somewhat independent of your agency and what you think about them. But these are things that you just discover about yourself. Oh, I, I find out that I happen to like this, that I, it seems like um, I'm that kind of person. I have these characteristics. Um, and this information is gathered by the same or analogous methods that you use to know other people. So you might observe your behavior to discover things about yourself. You might ask someone what they think, what kind of person you are, or you might use one of those technologies to find out, um, to discover things about yourself, this, this impersonal type of self-knowledge. Um, and yeah, so this is connected to the idea that parts of yourself are discovered. And in contrast to this, we have critical self-knowledge. Um, so here, the, the content of this critical type of self-knowledge is not just discovered by the individual, but it is actively generated. So this is, um, these are things where you make up your mind about something, for example. So this is an agential and essentially practical ability. And it is acquired by looking to the world and deciding what you have reason to, be, to believe and desire instead of looking inside and finding out what you happen to believe or desire. Um, yeah, so these are things where you um, are the author of those beliefs and attitudes and intentions, and you can be active and take responsibilities for, for them because we can avow them and change them and reject them. So we have some, um, yeah, we're more actively involved. And this is con um, connected to this idea of the self as actively and dynamically created. Um, and now I would also like to argue for a third category, which has not really received any attention so far, um, which is relational self-knowledge. And this is um, knowledge about how you fit into the world in a sense. So it is knowledge about how others define you um, in different ways. For example, others can define you through concepts and norms. So through um, being immersed in a culture, we know what, for example, being lazy means, what being um, black means, what being liberal means, um, and we learn how to ascribe this to us um, and to others, of course, also, as well. Um, so through others, we indirectly learn um, concepts we can apply to us and norms that we also apply to us. Um, what is being lazy? Is lazy a good thing or not, for example? Um, we also obviously also define us through relations to them. So we are someone's um, daughter, father, brother, friend, member of a book club. Um, so there's all these relations that that also are part of who we are and not part of, of our self knowledge to to know about these. Um, and then there's another more direct way in which others can define us, which is by imposing constraints and opportunities. So um, others can um, give us opportunities, for example, for, for, for jobs or for networks or to know people, and they can, can constrain us in our scope of action. Um, and one might think, yeah, well, it, is this really self-knowledge? Is this really about me, right? Because just because someone constrains me doesn't mean that this, this changes something about me, right? But I think insofar as we are defined by our actions, we can be defined by others who exercise control over what we can do in our lives. So if, for example, um, a woman in Afghanistan who can no longer study and she cannot become a doctor, um, we can say like, well, the, the Taliban hasn't really changed something about her in the sense that she still would have all the abilities to study. But as a matter of fact, she will never become a doctor and she will not be a person who defines herself um, by this, by her profession, for example. Um, and in this sense, all that can very actively define who we are. Um, so, and then this is connected to this idea of the self as defined by others to some degree and relational self-knowledge contains self-knowledge about those um, constraints and opportunities and, and concepts and norms that we get through others and, and the relations. Um, so put this, to put this together a bit, so it's based on the idea that the self is on the one hand objective, that is an object of inquiry and discovery for ourselves and others. 
It is also subjective. It is experienced and shaped through a subjective, first personal perspective and agency. And it is relational. It is influenced and constrained by others. Um, and now we can bring these two things together, use technologies with these different types of self-knowledge and look at um, yeah, how this technology contributes to self-knowledge or might contribute to self-knowledge um, and what ethical concerns that might arise there. And in terms of impersonal self-knowledge, um, I think one issue there is um, one of that we, that we would want to strive for more quality or quantity. Um, so on the one hand, if the information that we may receive through technology is reliable and substantial, um, technology can broaden our self-knowledge. So we might learn, we might learn that we have a genetic disease, and this is extremely important, um, valuable self-knowledge. Um, so it can provide just straightforward, valuable information. Um, it can also incite reflection that can lead to, to kind of impersonal um, self-knowledge. You might wonder, oh, why does Google think, I don't know, I like Italian food. Um, and then you might reflect on this and discover something and learn something about yourself and increase your self-knowledge. Um, or it can justify beliefs you already have. So maybe you knew you were, someone knew that they were like stressed at work and maybe they were one of these neurotech devices and it measures their stress level and it just justifies the belief that they had um, on a more measured objective um, level. But of course, um, this is kind of an ideal, ideal cases. At the same time, personal information through technology is very often accurate, um, biased and or trivial. So particularly those neurotech devices, um, their accuracy is not really um, well, well proven. Um, a lot of these algorithmic profiles have been shown to be biased. Um, and a lot of information is just trivial. So knowing how many steps you take a day um, is just not really contributing to your self-knowledge in any way that would increase like the value that self-knowledge is supposed to provide us. Um, and typically the algorithmic profiling is also often less reliable and less novel and interesting information because again, it is information that is not supposed to inform us, but supposed to inform other people um, who don't already know a lot of things about us. So a lot of the preferences or, or interests um, that are detected through algorithmic profiling um, are not really novel information for us and not really increasing our self-knowledge. Um, and another issue is that obsessive engagement in the pursuit of technological self-knowledge um, is at some point no longer productive to the goods self-knowledge can provide. So for example, if we say self-knowledge contributes to our well-being, um, but then if you really obsess about it and um, spend a lot of your time with these health trackers and measure everything that you can about yourself, you may end up um, reducing your well-being. Um, even though you may gather some uh, self-knowledge, some, some insights, um, it, there might be um, the payoff might not really um, be worth it. Um, and then a further topic is that uh, marginalized groups are often disadvantaged in terms of accuracy, bias and detail extensiveness. So um, studies have shown that, uh, for example, smartwatches are less accurate for people with darker skin. Um, a lot of those um, technologies are biased towards marginalized groups. Um, and an example for detail extensiveness is that um, the genetic testing company 23andMe, they can track down the um, geographic origin of your ancestors to over 2,000 regions worldwide. Um, and only 167 of those are in Africa, in the continent of Africa compared to 164 in the UK alone. So if, you, if your ancestors are from the UK, they can basically tell you which village they grew up in. Um, whereas if they're from Africa, it might be somewhere in Nigeria, for example. And those discre discrepancies in the quality of um, self-knowledge through technology can exacerbate already existing disadvantages for marginalized groups in healthcare, for example, in hiring processes, in the justice systems, and in other areas. 
And overall, like even the high cost um, in terms of like financial costs, but also privacy costs, for example, and the often lacking quality of personal information, those resources, I think, should often be invested elsewhere with an increased contribution to self-knowledge. Um, although, of course, we have to say other sources of self-knowledge are, of course, also imperfect. Um, and in some cases, it can still produce um, valuable information. Okay, but now let's move on to the um, critical self-knowledge. And here, I think an issue is that those technologies can make it hard to engage critically with this information. Um, and this for a number of reasons. Um, so first of all, this um, technologically sourced personal information can be hard to understand and assess. So it can be difficult to really understand, for example, these, these neurotechnologies, um, how does it really measure those brain waves? How does this really translate to emotional states and stress level? And so the technologies are complex. They're often um, company property and not um, accessible, how those algorithms work. Um, and this can make it hard to know what to do with this information and to critically engage with, to make up your mind about this information. What does it mean for you? Um, a second issue is that the information provided is often of statistical nature. And humans are just not very good at statistics. We just don't really, often we misunderstand statistical information. Um, and it's kind of hard to, to make up your mind about um, what does it mean, for example, that you're likely to be a re-offender? How do you reject or embrace this information is likely, makes this particularly difficult. Um, it's, it's hard to relate to it. Um, these technology also sometimes use alienating labels and categories. So sometimes, especially in algorithmic profilings, um, labels and categories are used, which do not really have a corresponding um, group in real life. So someone might be labeled as a um, novelty sweater buyer. And you just don't know, do you want to be part of this group or not? This is someone you should, something you should embrace. Like, who knows what this really means, who those people are. Um, and those, those um, labels and categories and disinformation cannot be challenged. It's not like when a friend tells you, you are very outgoing, then you can discuss with them why they think this. Whereas with these technological information, um, the information is just presented to you and there's no active engagement with, with someone else about it. You cannot challenge the information really, um, or it can be really difficult to do so. Uh, and this, like this picture of this, um, of you being completely measured by technologies, like every every bit of your body and of your um, um, preferences and and um, music tastes and movie tastes and every if every if this picture that everything is being measured and fixed, um, this can foster the belief that we do not really have any direct control over who we are, um, and of course we are not completely in control, um, but we have some control. And this picture of um, constant input of this is this is who you are can encourage this this belief that um yeah we are this who i am is something i discover and i'm not like actively critically engaged in that um but at the same time you have to say that in some cases technology can also encourage um self-constitution self-management um so for example if a health tracker reminds you to to follow through with the goal you've set for yourself of training every day, for example, um, it can help to make something true that you have um, that you have claimed to be true, that you have um, made up your mind about. I make up my mind that I'm someone who's going who's gonna to train every day now, and then the technology can help me um, to follow through with that. Um, but overall, I think this personal information technology typically does not encourage and facilitate critical self-knowledge and a critical engagement with the information it provides. And then the, the third dimension is the relational dimensions. And I think here what's interesting is that um, even if an algorithm is flawed and biased, it can sometimes reveal kind of the role or place that you have been assigned in the world and the opportunities and restrictions you face. 
Um, so it can be really helpful to know which kind of parameters flow into such an algorithm, how you feature on those parameters and how they translate um, into decision making or into, into categories. Um, and there are algorithms that make far reaching decisions about us, uh, which are really very often highly transparent. So not only do we not know which um, data is being used and which algorithms it is being fed into, but very often we don't even know that such an algorithm is being used, for example, to make hiring decisions. Um, and an example of this is that um, um, only 6% of Facebook users got to see a job advertisement for, um, uh, who, who got to see a job advertisement for a mechanic were women. And this fact is kind of indicative of the roles women are meant to take in this job market and which jobs are considered suitable for them. And that they still face obstacles when trying to pursue a career as a mechanic, for instance. So knowing these things can be informative um, about how you fit into the world, about the spaces others let you take in the world. Like, is, is being a mechanic something others will let me be or let me be without too many obstacles? Um, and on these grounds, we can say that the value of self-knowledge speaks in favor of transparency of information technology. And uh, further examples of more like indirect ways in which others, in this, which all these ways in which these relational dimensions shape us, um, is that technology also influences which characteristics are considered as meaningfully defining a person, as well as how those characteristics are defined and measured. For example, um, this genetic testing. Um, since this has become more accessible, there's more and more people who, for whom being 25% Croatian is an important part of their identity. So they change what people care about. Um, and they also change how we measure it. So um, heritage was much more likely to be defined in terms of um, upbringing, cultural heritage, than genetic heritage before this was available, of course. Um, and those categories and, and concepts that are um, created and applied by different technologies, they can influence our conceptual space positively or negatively. So if you are um, characterized as a woman by Google because you like female hobbies, this might reinforce some, um, some negative stereotypes um, that we might want to avoid. So I think here we can say that we should ensure that the categories and labels that used to characterize us avoid identity harms um, and that users are able to understand and challenge and potentially even correct them. Okay, and so in conclusion, so then I want to say that self-knowledge is a good and we have practical and moral reasons to pursue it. And technology does have the potential to give, to give us more of it if we use it right. Um, but this also means that we should ensure that personal information technology not only serves commercial interests, but our self-knowledge interests through accurate, transparent, inclusive, accessible, and controllable personal information. Okay, that's it. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Muriel. Uh, it was a pleasure to hear you. Uh, we were going to have the Q&A session afterwards, okay? So after Marco's uh, presentation, so uh, we're going to proceed to his presentation. Uh, nós vamos então a apresentação do professor Marco, que, bom, todos conhecem, mas o professor Marco tem graduação em medicina, é mestrado e doutorado em filosofia, é professor aqui da casa é, no Departamento de Filosofia, mas também na Faculdade de Medicina. De modo, sempre comento que o Marco é o nosso ornitorrinco. Então, está é, em todos os lugares, ao mesmo tempo, de várias espécies. E, é, como vocês também sabem, o Marco é especializado é, em temas de bioética, metaética e todas as discussões correlatas é, ao nosso evento. Então, Marco, muito obrigado pela sua, pela sua, pelo seu aceite, pela sua participação. É, por favor. 
thank you, Gabriel. Uh, thank you, thank you, Muriel. Nice to meet you. Uh, and uh, uh, it's good to see all of you here. I will make my presentation in English, but uh, what I'm going to do is something different that you are, uh, you know, uh, uh, you are accustomed. Is this, there is this word, I don't know, uh, of, with me, about me. Uh, I usually don't read. I usually make a speech or make, use the keyboard, etc. But I will read. Uh, of, of course, I will read and command and, and make comments. But uh, uh, this is a, a work in progress that I'm doing. Several or many of you uh, have uh, uh, already uh, heard about it uh, uh, I, I presented the, it, it in, a, in another version in Santa Catarina and including to, to some of my students. Uh, and I'm trying to rewrite this and uh, make some amendments. So I will uh, present to you another version of my uh, considerations about uh, what make uh, 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 what uh, 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 this 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 uh, issue that is the connection with medicine, uh, shared decision making, and chatbots or uh, artificial intelligence system uh, that can be used by physicians and patients. Uh, the issue we will, we will talking about uh, this uh, uh, three days. So the new title I I'm. Uh, creating to my uh, presentation is, could we share med medical decisions with a chatbot? Uh, or why will people will still prefer real doctors to trading them for AI systems? Uh, one of the issues we are discussing here is uh, with the development of uh, AI systems and technology, uh, uh, which or uh, what uh, professions or occupations will resist or will still exist in the future. Uh, uh, some say that uh, the occupations, as I said, uh, such as uh, the simple occupations will disappear. And this is a big problem, big sociological or political problem. And uh, maybe, as Dora says, uh, the more uh, the profession, the traditional professions could still uh, uh, exist, uh, will uh, exist in the future, uh, even though the AI technology uh, will advance. But uh, my point here is not actually, I'm not actually interested or worried about the future existence of medicine because I will retire. I'm going to retire soon, and you also probably will not be interested in it for you because this will occur many, many years, uh, those deaths, uh, many years ago after you, uh, of course. Many years after nah, uh, you'll be there. So uh, the point is not uh, actually to discuss the problem of the existence in the future of medicine. The problem is something near the, the issue of Muriel. It's about us. It's about, uh, she's interested in self-knowledge and the value of self-knowledge. I'm interested in the issue of what make us different from the machines, for example. So this is the, 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 the main issue of my uh, discussion. So I, I will read and and, and uh, explain some issues for you. Uh, uh, let me begin supposing, uh, assuming, so that AI technology uh, will advance and more than we have today. Here, for example, what uh, Rigo uh, says to us that uh, different kind of AI technology will, 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 will emerge uh, with different kind of trainings, uh, uh, with uh, uh, without the limitations that uh, they have today. So uh, let's suppose that uh, very good chatbots, uh, similar to those that uh, in the 
fantastic or or uh, let me say the the how do you say the 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 the, 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 the films the movies uh, 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 says uh, that will exist in the future. So let's assume that a, as AI technology advances, including systems that employ big data analytics and machine learning, current clinical practice will undergo radical changes in the healthcare domain. And given uh, that, an essential question is what current health practice, healthcare practice will resist this change. But a more interesting question is. Uh, would it be desirable for medicine or for us uh, to, be, uh, uh, to become a mode of interaction between people or subjects, currently patients, and AI systems? So you and AI systems alone, uh, or with the support of a physician, for example, me. Uh, but uh, the point is, uh, it will be interest. Uh, it, it will be of interest of you in the future that uh, AI systems ev evolve uh, without the need for the participation of intermediation of health professionals. Uh, so I, I begin to suggesting a, an experience, uh, an experience machine uh, experiment, uh, uh, or as I say, experience machine challenge. So consider this futuristic scenario. Suppose you are in an experience machine. Uh, you know, I think all of you know the experience machine uh, ex uh, 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 speculation of Robert Nozick. Uh, uh, which, and, and suppose that this experience machine passes the Turing test. That is a high-tech machine that makes you believe you are in a real conversation with a subject, but in fact is a chatbot that efficiently simulates human agency. Hence, you misleadingly think that you are having a conversation with a human individual endowed with agency capabilities, an individual who acts intentionally endowed hence with mental states or events that, yes, you believe, cause their behavior. You believe that. It's not. So I'm not thinking about uh, is the machine an agent or a person. No, no, no. It, it is, it's not. It's a machine but that efficiently simulates what we do. Uh, uh, so if you, uh, 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 nevertheless, uh, you are actually alone because you are not with another person, you are, with, you, you are with a machine. There is no other agent except you. I think the question, if the machines, nowadays machines, uh, chatbot, uh, Ch uh, ChatGPT, or the future, our agent is a very interesting question, but I'm I'm simply assuming the, here that they are not. Okay, so uh, they are not agents. We resolved this question that they are not agents, uh, and uh, so you are alone. You are uh, not with another agent. With uh, so, if you make decisions, for example, uh, about therapeutics. Uh, even if you convincingly believe that he or she is cooperating in sharing decisions with you, the brute fact is that you cannot share, neither pass the buck to the chatbot. You are not deciding with the chatbot. Uh, the point is, could you complain about the chatbot in case you regret its recommendations or pre prescriptions like me, for example, uh, as, uh, as my questions before? Nah. Uh, I asked something to the chat GPT and say and concluded that this is not a good answer. Can I complain with the chatbot? Now, uh, you can ask about what is more advantageous, having a real conversation with a human agent or with a chatbot. As a matter of fact, some people prefer not to share with experts their doubts and decisions about issues that matter for them. Some people, for example, do not prefer to consult psychologists. Uh, some people like me, as I said to you, prefer not to consult physicians. I am a physician, and I know that. So I do not prefer to consult them, but I consult sometimes. <laughs> uh, but the reason that uh, 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 in, this, in this case is that they likely prefer not to hand over to others, even experts. Decisions about aspects they consider fundamental to their lives. Maybe this is it at odds 
with what seems reasonable to many people. It's better to consult an expert in matters we believe you are epistemically fragile. And I am. I am epistemically fragile for a lot of issues. Uh, psychiatry, some of psychiatry issues, some about uh, uh, questions that are including very simple in medicine. Uh, so, however, should we simply transfer the responsibility to the side to the experts? This is a question people usually do or can do. Why we uh, transfer the responsibility to the, the decision to the expert? This question is at the heart of several approaches on the issue of autonomy in healthcare, a principle that seems to imply that people have or must have or must have the privilege of acting by their own account, independently of the fact that they are or not in a worse epistemic circumstance comparatively to experts. The general view in this case is that epistemic authority does not imply political powers over others. Uh, so worried about that, if I uh, have an appointment, for example, to a physician, I uh, can uh, be submitted to another person. So people can conclude that they can resist this. They can first try to uh, solve the problem with them with themselves. With their, their so the belief that the epistemic authority implies juridical or political power over epistemically less advantaged people is tantamount to a paternalistic view that is in direct contradiction with civil freedom or liberty, or uh, at least is, I think, the worry. Uh, that uh, liberals, for example, have about the uh, the power of authorities and experts. Uh, and this is a problem, uh, an old problem of the worry of, um, in this case, medical paternalism. So uh, many of the complaints against medicine are based on blunt criticism of its paternalistic tradition. Uh, this is why some bioethicists have emphasized that the role of the experts cannot be seen as that of someone who, is, who simply takes the place of the person who seeks for help. Criticism is often directed at the idea that the practice of medicine must be supported by a table of virtues and hence on a substantive conception of its social role. The criticism of this idea, uh, uh, the, 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 there are bioethicists that support this idea. For example, uh, um, uh, Pellegrino. Uh, uh, Edmund Pellegrino says, it's important for medicine that it, it, it's, it, uh, the profession be supported by virtues. So I think that the liberal criticisms or the autonomist criticism is uh, say, no, this is, this is a danger. No, medicine should not be supported by virtues of this kind, uh, uh, of this kind. So uh, 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 I think that this bioethical theorist known as autonomist emphasize that experts' commitments should be restraining only to provide the most appropriate technical, technical response to the questions made from those that seek for their help. The idea is that in a free society, professional expertise cannot be extended to the domain of people's values and preference. It's not a matter for physicians. This is the idea, I think, for the autonomous uh, belief. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, professionals in this case should restrain themselves to offer recommendations not constrained by any special or role morality. I remember a, a, a bioethicist that is, uh, Diego Gracia Guillén, he is, is, is an, uh, an Spanish bioethicist. In a conference he made here in Brazil a couple of years, dozen of years uh, ago, he said uh, that uh, the, uh, there is no place today for a role morality. He called morale, moralidade role. Uh, that is, physicians, uh, 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 bioethics uh, should not offer to physicians and health professionals any substantive conception of political morality about their role. All, uh, their role is only to offer technical solutions to the technical problems 
that uh, patients uh, ask or demand to them. Uh, in, in, uh, uh, I'm not supporting this view. May, uh, caution. Uh, uh, I'm not supporting the view. I'm only saying that this is what I uh, understand the autonomist claim. Uh, this is this seems actually to be in tune with a model a model of professional ethics that respects people's liberty and freedom. However, in this case, what's the problem and dangers of AI medicine? Why would we care about that the conversation partner is, uh, is a real person if the magical job can be done efficiently by artificial system? I think uh, 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 in the last uh, uh, roundtable uh, we saw, this was one of my comments to Rigo again. Uh, today, he says, we have limited uh, systems of AI uh, technology. But uh, we can train in the future the AI systems to develop other capabilities, other capacities or abilities. I don't know if one of these three. But uh, the point is, uh, suppose, let us suppose, uh, assume that it will be done, it can be done in the future. So we can have uh, AI systems very uh, different from nowadays and better in a sense. So uh, the point is, if those uh, systems could offer uh, technical solutions that are reliable and appropriate, why, why we would be bothered uh, with uh, having a real uh, connection with a person, or in, for example, in medicine, or uh, with a lawyer, or a magistrate, including, uh, or a teacher, including, maybe. So if you really prefer not to partake or transfer the responsibility of making decisions, that is, if you always prefer to take decision by your own, then a simulation of a conversation with an AI system that can offer reliable information and advice is preferable to having a real conversation with an, ex with an expert. But if you believe that it's preferable in circumstances where you are epistemically fragile, to have a real to have a real conversation with a real expert this is a different uh, note that there, there are different uh, a difference here you can uh, 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 recognize that you are epistemically fragile it doesn't imply that if you are epistemically fragile you should appoint uh, have an appointment to a real person no not necessarily uh, the point is if you agree and why this is a question, but if you believe that it's preferable to have a real conversation, why? This is a this is a, another question. But if you uh, uh, prefer or still prefer to have a real conversation with a real person, then uh, uh, you would probably prefer that that person could be helped by an intelligent and efficient artificial system. Uh, and that would certainly increase the appropriateness and effectiveness of her or their pres prescriptions. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about two possibilities in the future. Or you, uh, uh, the, the, uh, there are three possibilities. Uh, the first possibility is to maintain what we have today. You go to a doctor and the, the doctor decides because you are epistemically fragile, you cannot participate in the decision. So. Let him, let him or her decide. Uh, so uh, I'm wondering about in the future of two possibilities: uh, the possibility of to have an appointment to a doctor that is that is empowered or supported or uh, uh, by an AI system, you and he, as uh, Flavio suggested, and another possibility that uh, uh, forget doctors forget experts. Uh, so why that possibility is not preferable to the, to, to, to the, to the second? The first, uh, I'm skipping away. Uh, soon people will wonder which advantage they will still have in interacting with real human agents instead of interacting with intelligent chatbots that efficiently simulate agency. I suspect that people will prefer a world 
where human interactions will real remain real, but can be efficiently enhanced by AI tools. And the reason derives from the reasons that would probably let people not to intend to live in a world that is only subjective, the same reason that they will not uh, uh, they will not prefer to uh, live in a machine experiment, sort of. Uh, but uh, uh, of, that is, people prefer to have real connections. And one of kind of real connections we have is with experts. So, uh but there is another reason similar but probably derived from this that the, this general reason that we prefer to have real connections with people uh, which justifies the existence of professions particular medicine uh so uh an argument for the preference of maintaining interaction with experts rather than simply substitute them by ai reliable systems can be highlighted, I think, by the argument that for the reasonableness of commands from authorities. This is something I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, I'm studying, but uh, it's a work in progress. I'm not sure if this is uh, completed. So consider Joseph Ra's approach on exclusionary reasons. Actually, I think that Joseph Ra's approach to law and to uh, the general approach to law and the general approach to authority uh, is misguided, I think. Uh, I think that uh, Joseph Rask conflates the uh, reasons to abide to legal authorities to the reasons to abide or to follow an advice to an, of an expert. Uh, so I th this is uh, th something I, I think is, is, is wrong in, in, in his theory. But, uh, the concept of exclusionary reasons are a, a, a good concept. Uh, the concept uh, of exclusionary reasons is something like this. There are, according to Ras, negative second order reasons for not having certain valid first, valid first order reasons as our guiding reasons. If P is a fourth order reasons for the subject S to perform action phi, and Q is a reason for S not to phi, for P, then Q is an exclusionary reason, uh, a negative second order reason, a reason to not to follow a reason. You got it? Uh, so Russ argued that exclusionary reasons are preemptive reasons for action. I, I don't think so, but uh, uh, preemptive reasons are reasons that uh, uh, simply exclude, uh, uh, they are preemptive in force. Uh, to other reasons, but uh, generally uh, uh, they are. So uh, he argued that exclusionary reasons are preemptive reasons for action. If one has an exclusionary reason E for not feeing for a certain first order reason R, one should not fee. Orders, but the, the, the one problem uh, for me uh, is uh, uh, his intention, that is to support a general theory of law that I, that's not my topic here. Uh, 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 for example, the main uh, example for us is orders, orders for command, command, commandments uh, or superiors. So orders are made as emperor for us. This led him to develop a general theory about the reasonableness of being commanded by authorities, authorities, legal authorities, and uh, expert authorities. Uh, Ras theory is called a service conception. Uh, that is, law is genuinely, genuinely authoritative insofar as, as it helps the subjects of the law to do what they really ought to do better than they would without the mediation of law directors. Is the, the, he calls this the normal justification condition. I think that one problem of Ras' theory of law is that it conflates authority of law with epistemic authority, as I, as I said. It's different. Now, someone may be justified in abdicating their beliefs in favor of an expert's recommendation if they are correctly convinced that the expert, expert is in a more privileged epistemic position than themselves on the matter. But the view that obeying legitimate authorities command puts the agent in a better situation than disobedience is a very questionable assumption. Sometimes we have to disobey, I think. But uh, despite that, 
the service conception in the normal justification uh, uh, approach seem to apply to the expert layman relationship. Now, following the normal uh, justification uh, condition, uh, uh, rational, if an interaction with an AI system puts agents in better circumstance than with experts, then patients have reason to prefer to follow the AI system rather than to comply with human expert advice. Hence, if what, if what ultimately matters are patients' best interests, it would be preferable in the future to interact with truth, truth words, worthy AI systems rather than with fallible human experts. Uh, hence, apply it to our issue. Normal justification condition justifies agents to prefer to submit their preference and opinions to the advice of a reliable AI system. In this case, preferring to maintain relationships with human experts, such as doctors, for example, instead of consulting more reliable, available AI systems, would be irrational and wise, foolish. Even the option of consulting real doctors aided by AI systems would be foolish, for it would be less efficient and unnecessary. So I think that uh, if we uh, took the uh, take the the RAS theory of authority, uh, the autonomist view that I presented uh, above uh, uh, follows. So in the future, uh, we should not look for experts to take decisions. Uh, uh, I argue, uh, nevertheless, that Ross' general theory of authority applied to domain of expertise led us to what I will call here the simulation problem. The simulation problem arises in a circumstance in which for agents who ration rationally prefer to transfer or share decisions with an expert on topics over which they recognize ignorance. The conclusion uh, 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 that it is in their best interest to prefer to consult an, uh, an AI system that competently simulates this role results, results self-defeating. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, I don't know if you uh, uh, understood. Uh, I think that is self-defeating because they want to be connected with real persons. But if, if they follow the normal justificatory condition, they should be get rid of them. Uh, so, uh, uh, nevertheless, by preferring to consult an AI system in situations where this can occur reliably, the agent does not transfer any decision at all. That's the point. If he prefer to transfer decision or to share decision, uh, if he prefer to, uh, if he follows the normal justification uh, condition, uh, uh, he should not. So, uh, of course, if all that matters is acting in a way that guarantees the best decision, the alternative of maintaining the relationship with experts such as doctors, instead of consulting AI systems is unwise. Even the option of consulting real doctors aided by AI systems would be foolish. The problem is that the simulation of a real relationship takes away from the agent one of its original motivations. Transferring, that is the usual. People sometimes look for experts simply for transferring their responsibilities. Or at least sharing the decision making with real subjects. But why could people prefer to share decisions with real agents instead of simulating them? or making decisions without any help. And the reason, I think, is at the core of the value of sharing responsibilities. That is, people that prefer to live with real persons and share responsibilities and live in a world that we share. The, 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 for example, uh, in a world uh, that, that, uh, uh, that, we, that are, there are compacts, uh, conventions made for many people, so uh, people who prefer to transfer or share decisions prefer to interact with real people for an obvious reason, obvious reason. Only real agents can share responsibilities. So my conclusion uh, is this. The prediction that patients are likely to prefer real human agents as they are, they are doctors rather than being assisted by AI systems brings to light some essential aspects 
of what we understand by personalized medicine and its value as a professional endeavor. Medicine is a highly significant human interaction for people's lives in general. I, I think that people want doctors because they love doctors. They love people. That's the, the reason. They love me. This is why they look for me. Uh, uh, this is why they don't <laughs> substitute me for a robot. Uh, health intervention form an essential part of people biographies, which makes health an essential aspect of human health being. Uh, health is an essential aspect because this uh, is part of our lives. We look for doctors, people that uh, uh, accompany us, uh, is with us. Uh, when we began to believe, when, that was, when, they are, when we are newborns, <laughs> for example, uh, children. So, in fact, in matters of personalized healthcare, people could prefer to interact or share responsibilities with their doctors and caregivers rather than simply seeking information by themselves, even though this often seems to be more compatible with an idealized ideal of individual autonomy. It might seem that interactions between individuals and AI systems would favor the autonomy of agents. However, as human autonomy, as Muriel says, including, is essentially relational. It's likely that people will still prefer to maintain interactions mediated by AI systems with professionals they trust, even in a future uh, where supported by uh, AI systems, they can make such decisions on their own account. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Marco. And uh, now we're going to have our Q and A session, uh, both to Professor Marco and Professor Muriel. So, yes, Um Thank you. Uh, I have a question for each of you, uh, Professor Muriel. Uh, my name is Dale. I'm the f from the Federal University of Santa Catarina. I really enjoy your talk. But I have, uh, um, I was in doubt whether you were justifying self knowledge just saying that is useful for ABC, but you said also that there is a duty to, to self knowledge. So I, I was in doubt whether uh, what kind of justification you have for for this kind of duty to self knowledge. Could you explain, please? And for Marco, um, Marco, I think I, I understand your conclusion, and if I accept the, the premise, uh, I think you are right. But uh, um, are you not sure that uh, chatbots or robots? cannot be agents, because if they are, your your conclusion doesn't follow, because we, yes. we as a patient, I could share my responsibility to an, an artificial agent. So I'm not uh, really co uh, convinced about your, your conclusion. I, I was reading the kind of paper uh, Alcino was sharing this morning, and they refer to, to Jat uh, GPT has an agent in a very straightforward way. Thank you. That will be your first. Um, okay, yeah, hello, nice to meet you and, and thank you for the question. Um, yeah, so this, this idea of duty to know oneself, yeah, I, I did not argue for that at all. And um, I'm also not so sure how much I believe it. Um, in, the, in this point, I just wanted to raise some I think like some like very straightforward ways that we probably all agree, ways in which like self-knowledge is valuable. Um, and then some others which are more controversial, but we, which are also um, raised in the literature. So this argument for um, a duty to know oneself is if I remember this paper correctly, um, she argued that um, if you have like, if you love someone, you have, um, um, because of, of that love, there's like an intrinsic motivation to know that person. Um, so loving someone means wanting to know that person. And because we should be in a relationship to ourselves, um, which contains self-love. So we, we have like a norm 
um, there, there's a norm how we should relate to oneself and there's an argument that um, yeah we should love ourselves and this would entail that we should try to know ourselves um, so this is more or less the argument um, but I have to say I, I don't really I don't know how how much I buy into the argument but I I wanted to list it as a possibility at least of um, a reason why um, self-knowledge what might also be valuable yeah well thank you uh, first thank you uh, uh, Darley because uh, I think a philosopher uh, is delighted by the recognition that uh, his argument would be sound if you agree with my my premises so thank you very much uh, uh, I think I, I simply did my job, and <laughs> this is this is okay for me. But uh, because your question is more difficult to answer, if chatbot, the present chatbots are agents or not, I uh, I I I, uh, I don't know how to answer this. But I uh, and, and I didn't read this paper. I don't know if this can offer me a better argument by. For now, I simply follow something in the lines of Gabriel, for example, before, and I simply assume that it, they are not. So if we have a concept, actually, let me say something about agent. Uh, this is something that ap appeared here in the discussion. Uh, for example, Dora says that uh, chatbots and AI systems can be agents, but not moral agents. Uh, and in the discussions with the students uh, in the morning, I discussed this. Uh, I think that this uh, predicate, uh, this ad adjective, moral agent to agent, is ocious. Uh, so I think I simply think that uh, 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 ocious. Or how to, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I think I think I sim simply think that uh, at, at least in morality discussions, moral discussions, or uh, we let us, uh, we have to assume that. Uh, agents are individuals that can uh, act by intentions, for example, and and uh, we have to understand those intentions in a roughly phenomenological conception of intentionality. Uh, so uh, in this case, we, the chatbot is not an agent, but I simply are not simply uh, suggest uh, or suggesting that in the future we will not have better systems or different kind of systems that uh, that can work differently. And in this case, they will be agents. And if they will be agents, they will share. They will share with uh, responsibilities such as data of the Star Trek or uh, the the the. The, the the centenarian man, the, I don't know the bicentenario man. They are agents, but they uh, 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 and maybe some animals can be agents in this sense, no problem. But the today, uh, the machines are not, uh, uh, still are not agents, and so I'm assuming that they are not. And uh, but if they become agents. They will share responsibilities, and we will ask if you prefer to, uh, uh, for example, to uh, have an appointment with Data or uh, to Marco. Well, this is a problem. Who you love more, uh, Marco or Data? Well, I know. Uh, Spock, for example, will uh, look for Data. Uh, no, Spock, the other, the other, <laughs> the, 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 the different serial serials. <laughs> Uh, hello. Uh, my question is to to Marco. Uh, if this is the case, uh, it's a epistemic problem, uh, like uh, the problem of uh, the testimony. Like uh, if you testimony. Yeah. If you, in one hand, uh, you believe in you, you saying that, uh, or you believe that you're a doctor, or you choose a path to to believe in AI, AI doctor, mm. for example. And, uh, and as uh, my, I wrote an article recently about this, 
uh, asking why we need to close the question uh, if people need to follow a real doctor or a AI doctor, like, because in reality, uh, we have people like with critical sense, for example, you or maybe more people. Uh, it, this is the reality that there are people that can decide by themselves if in a specific situation it's better to believe in a real doctor or in a AI doctor. So uh, it's not a there is if a, there is a is a epistemic problem if why you cannot think like this like in a specific situation i would choose the real doctor because uh, it's, if i are looking for a cancer problem i would prefer a, a real doctor because in another case like a head cake okay i always check dpt and okay it's fine uh -huh. so why you cannot work with this both reality at the same time uh, uh, I think this is a very good question. Uh, and one problem is what we mean by testimony. Uh, but if we have a broad concept of testimony that includes that a machine can be something like this, a test testimony, if a machine can be, uh, I'm not sure about that. I'm not epistemologist, but I think it's possible that a machine can be uh, it's testimony that I say. Uh, the, uh, 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 well, uh, my answer is the reason uh, why we look for uh, subjects such as doctors is not only epistemic. For example, if the reason is only epistemic, if the reason is only to supply your epistemic fragility, we have to find a robot or a AI system. This is better. The reason is not that. The reason is that we have to be attached. Uh, we have we we want uh, relationships. That's the reason. Uh, uh, people, uh, this is my experience. This is my experience. Uh, my experience is like this. I know some colleagues, doctors that I know because I am a doctor that they are not good doctors, but that the patients love them love them because they do the uh, person-centered <laughs> healthcare, something like this. Uh, they uh, 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 show uh, an, a, a, a honest preoccupation, for example, for what they are feeling. So, uh, and, and, and this is something people uh, want uh, uh, in real relationships, including experts, I think. I'm not sure about lawyers. I'm not sure about lawyers, but prof, uh, teachers, uh, teachers. I, I, I'm looking for a real teacher, for example. Uh, teachers, doctors. I think I'm sure. No lawyers too. Lawyers too. Okay. <laughs> Alguma outra questão? Alguma outra questão? No, uh, I do have. It, it's not a. It's not a. Okay. Mateus? No? Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. 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 Well, thanks for the... Yeah. No, I think what both of you say is relevant to, you know, I want to talk about person-centered care later, but what you're saying here, Marco, it seems to me, is that, you know, there's a broader notion of reasoning going on mm. than simply getting information from a source um, and then making the decision. So there's something about certain dichotomies that need to be broken down there. You know, and your, your practitioner needs to be a person uh, yes, because that's, that's they enter into shared decision making and responsibility so i think there's a lot of overlap between what you you brought you mentioned person-centered care then there's a lot of overlap between what both of you have been discussing and the person-centered care debate uh is, is, you know, i just think it's very because it's very interesting i just thought perhaps i mean you are i mean it, it might be useful it seems to me for some of the stuff that you're saying about AI to be brought directly into that debate, because there's debates now about what we mean by person-centered care. And you sketched effectively the model that you rejected, it seems to me, is one of the two models of person-centered care that I would want to discuss, and I would reject it as well, the one that you rejected. So there's a lot of overlap between these debates. I think you can inform what is a developing debate with the stuff that you're both doing. 
but I don't know if that's there's really isn't really a question there. But I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm getting you right, aren't I? Mm. I'm sure if I understood the question, can you? Can you help me? Because my hearing uh, problem is. Okay. Well, yeah. No, I thought. Uh, well, well, I agree with you. Ah, yeah. Yes, that, that's a, but, but I, I don't. Your notion of distance, I can't hear it. I, I... Sorry. Okay. Um, am I not speaking okay. to the? Yeah, okay. If I understood Marco, he's saying that the kind of uh, argument you are presenting can help and inform uh, a version, a conception of the uh, person-centered no, certainly. Yeah. Certainly. certainly. If I understand. Certainly, that is, that is the, certainly, that is, that is. And? Yeah, I mean, what you call the autonomous view seems to me to correspond to a certain view of person-centered care that I'd want to outline, called the normal science plus view, is what that is what I would call it. The idea that, um, Somehow, professionals just provide the expertise, the knowledge, and the uh, and whereas the um, and then the patient supplies the values. I think that's a very that's becoming a very dominant model of person centered care because it's easy to implement in practices and to put into policy documents. But I also think it's a dangerous model, mm -hmm. and that we do need you know a, a broader notion, even though it's more difficult to spell out. We need a broader notion that brings in this notion of shared decision making. Mm. I'm not sure if I'm here. <laughs> okay, well. Just in, in, in my comment actually it's it's built upon what Professor said. Because I I I think that's one one point of your well actually two two things. Firstly, uh I totally agree with you, but I, I think you over relied on the, the the standpoint of the shared the shared decision. Because if we think about the centered person uh, framework, one of the parts of it is, for instance, improving the relationship between the physician and the patient. Right. So uh, from this point of view, we're not talking only about uh, shared decisions or these data things related or not even uh, related to agency or to choosing this path or that path or either or it's not we're not talking about it's closer to your answer to be that because um, see see this question oh if I had only a kind of usual or daily headache I wouldn't care to uh -huh. be treated by an AI chatbot, right? But if it was cancer, I would prefer a regular human being, a person, and so on. But why? Because one of these dimensions of this person-centered uh, framework for, for medicine is this kind of, is you, you call it love, okay? Mm -hmm. Or like joking, general but sense. okay, you're kidding. But, but I mean, this kind of things is not is not only related to this shared decision. It's not a matter of decision at all. The, the main point of the, the, the physician patient relationship, but it's more like I, I wouldn't like to use that word, but I, I don't have any one better now. It's a kind of existential relationship. Yes, yes, that's the, it. The, that's the, it. And, and that point, and that's that's why Vita said, oh. It, if it was cancer, I would rather prefer a human being doctor. Because I and, and I, I totally agree with, with, with him because I think this your 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 thoughts could uh, bring this this uh, uh, dimension of person centered uh, framework yeah. to the surface. Right, right. and uh, uh, let me say that I didn't read uh, st uh, uh, still didn't read uh, Michael's book, but I suspect, I suspect that what he used uh, advancing or, or suggesting or claiming in the book is similar, but I don't, um, um, uh, how am I, how can I say, I don't master the vocabulary or the conceptuality of phenomenology uh, and existential is about this, but I think that one reason why people look for me is something 
kind of a sensation of loneliness. Do you understand? People feel themselves when they are disrupted by illness is something uh, near to a, 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 a loneliness. I'm alone. I need someone to help me. So people look for help and not necessarily those people are in a better condition to uh, help them to understand. Sometimes I, as a physician, look for a friend or for a father and they are in a worse condition epistemic than me about medicine, for example. So, of course, if you uh, add to this the existence of someone that you uh, accept that is in a better condition than you and better, better, supported by knowledge today, knowledge or AI system, advice that can help them to assess knowledge. This is better. This is better for me. So uh, th this is what I, uh, I'm claiming that, uh, 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 as I said in the beginning, my interest is not actually to uh, 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 make reflections on AI because I am a, an AI philosopher. What I'm looking is to understand what we mean by personalized medicine today. That's the thing. Is he first? No, it's, it's me. Uh, so, Marco, as I understood, uh, you were trying to. Uh, better, right? <laughs> uh, you were trying to uh, point out that people would choose either a doctor or an EA system, like a chat box, to uh, talk to and understand and reason about their problem. Uh, would it be possible? in your point of view, that the future physicians are more of a moderator to, you said they're really bad physicians nowadays, they're good physicians, bad physicians. And AI systems, they have the power to access knowledge in a way that a regular physician does not. So would it be possible that in the future, Physicians are a moderator of what AI systems bring yes. uh, to information, yes. and then they pass this to the in person. They pass this to the the oh, patient. Good. And if I understood your question, is it, it's exactly what Flavio argued yesterday? You didn't. Uh, yes, I was here. I was here. Yeah. Uh, in the future, uh, experts like uh, doctors, such as doctors. Uh, would be uh, curators. Yes. Mm -hmm. Curators. Mm -hmm. uh, they help people to assess knowledge and in, actually information to create knowledge about them, self knowledge, including or, 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 uh, because it's created as Muriel uh, mm -hmm. says. So, uh, physicians in the, the, the future will be like curators of the information added by. Uh, data and AI systems. Uh, to so yeah, yeah. Use that. This, this, I think, is the uh, apex of uh, shared decision making. Uh, the, the idea that we really share a decision uh, and not like today, that is not actually shared decision making. Is here's this. Uh, 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 people, uh, uh, in my experience, uh, patients, uh, I, I don't have this in a, a, as an uh, data, uh, for example. Uh, I don't have data to support what I will say today, but I suspect that most patients prefer not to participate with their uh, physicians to share decisions. They prefer to, uh, 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 to let the doctors decide. Uh, so this is a problem of responsibility, I said. Uh, people prefer to prefer or not to take responsibility for the decision or at least to share, not to decide for, theirs, for themselves. But, but I, I think that's the, uh, the, uh, the, 
that's what physicians are made for. Uh -huh. uh, when I go to Marco's office, my kids, uh, he's the pediatrician of my three kids, and he always says, uh, he opens the, the systems in the computer and shows me and say, we have this, we have that, what, uh, we can choose this or that. I think this is better. What do you want? So I think, I think this is better, but sometimes people feel anxious. Mm -hmm. We offer to them, we present, we take the picture of, for example, the computer and say, oh, this is the alternative. No, 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 Dr. Yeah. I prefer you decide. Uh, uh, people sometimes is like, uh, still like this. Mm -hmm. uh, and, we, uh, and I think that physicians have to uh, resist this uh, and, and, and call the patients to share the decision. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe, can I maybe also ask a question? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was wondering if what well, you think of the idea that one reason why people might want to um, go to a human doctor um, might also be because they kind of know more what they're talking about. Like in the sense that when I think Oh, would I want to go to a doctor who has had the same disease already that I'm facing? And I think, yeah, but that might be nice. Like they, they know what I'll be facing from a like first personal perspective. Um, and of course, not every doctor will have had whatever disease you're going to, but at least they know uh, pain. They know um, what it might mean for relationships with um, partners or, or children um, when you go through a certain... Um, disease and of course like an ai might give you the same like exact same advice let's say for your relationship but it's, it's different when someone says it who kind of knows what's it about like who, who has experienced that right and like someone who has something to say about the topic in terms of having experienced um at least parts of 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 what you might experience and can actually yeah, also imagine maybe what what you might go through. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you, Maria. Uh, and if I got what you meant is that people sometimes look for doctors for uh, not asking for something that, uh, for example, what's happening. It's something like this. For example, what's happening with me. Uh, in the sense that, uh, could you help me with that? Uh, not in the sense that uh, the person uh, wants an answer, but uh, this is something near what uh, what I think you were trying to 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 to, to say to us. That they want to understand themselves, uh, and so uh, and this is an issue that the. Uh, that is in part a relationship, uh, a, a, a relationship not, uh, is a, uh, a state of affairs that is, that is not, uh, uh, let me say, isolated in me. I don't know if I'm quite well uh, uh, clear. That is, uh, our questions about us uh, are questions that uh, 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 goes out, goes beyond us. That's the point. Uh, well, so, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we have finished the session, right? So, thank you once again, Professor Muriel. It was a pleasure to have you here with us, Professor Marco. Thank you once again. Nós uh, terminamos a nossa sessão e convido a todos a voltarem para a sessão da noite, às 19h30, correto? Então, temos aí uh, um tempinho para a janta, tá? E voltamos à noite com a conferência do professor... Michael. Tudo bem, queridos? Sim. Então, muito obrigado. obrigado. Thank you, Muriel. Thank you so very Thank much. You.